Before we jump into this, actually, let me just say there has been some accusations of my theology in the past week. And those accusations come from certain people who obviously have not taken the time to listen or read or understand uh, my position, which is fair. I understand people are busy and I understand that people don't uh, always, uh, you know, feel like jumping down rabbit holes that they might disagree with. Okay, so that's, that's totally fine. Uh, however, I will clarify my position. I believe this is Rob's position as well. Correct me if I am wrong, Rob. I know that this is also my father's position. I believe, now we are, have been very critical of certain parts of uh, rabbinic Judaism uh, on the show, especially Kabbalah and whatnot, but we're also critical of those who read back into the first century rabbinical works, such as the Talmud and the Mishnah. And what, what I mean by read back into is, are there things that are in the Mishnah that we see in the Apostolic Scriptures in the New Testament? I would say the answer is sure. But that doesn't mean that they got them in the New Testament from the Mishnah. What it means is that the Mishnah was written 400 years later. They could have looked at the New Testament and said, hey, we're going to say that we had it first. That's a possibility. It could be that that was an established tradition that now is carrying over and they're writing about it in the Mishnah. That's another possibility. Um, there's all sorts of different possibilities that go on. But the Mishnah and the Talmud are later works. And they reflect a historical uh, problem that is happening in the time that they are written, which is that Judaism is under attack and they are trying to solidify various Jewish customs, Jewish codify even a code. Thank like, you. It's yeah. like a code of a code of identity. Right. Exactly. And so to re when we say read back into the first century, what we mean is you can't just say, oh, yeah, the Mishnah was around in the first century or look in the Mishnah and see what we have here. They're talking, you know, clearly this was what Yeshua was talking about. It would be the other way around. Yeshua is talking about this. Therefore, the Mishnah talks about it. Now, what does that say for the Mishnah and the Talmud? And I was accused this week of saying that the Mishnah and the Talmud have no place in history, in our study of the Bible and wow. history. That is absolutely not true at all. I use the Mishnah and the Talmud often to see what the prevailing Jewish view was of something in the fourth century and beyond. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm reading it back into the first century. However, there is another thing that we can do. We can look at uh, things in the, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, and those they're, they're separated by quite a, a good amount of time as well. So I, I would mainly say this for the Mishnah. We can look at things that are written in the Mishnah. We can look at things that are written in other historical books like Josephus, Philo, um, you know, some of the church fathers, things like this. And we can look at those and then we can say, okay, so we have a witness in the first century, right, of, of the Gospels. And then it seems from all these other historical books that this was something that was happening in the first century. And the Mishnah also talks about that. So it looks like this tradition carried over or the people in the fourth century agreed with the, what was going on in the, in the first century. And so this can be another witness if you have multiple witnesses. But once again, you, you have to say that that witness is late, right? It's not a, it's not a first century witness. So we have to use the, the Mishnah and the Talmud within their respective time, place, and historicity. That's what we mean by we can't read the rabbinical works back into the first century. Rob, do you have anything to say about that before we move on? Because I, yeah, I mean, I think it's an important like, it's point. It's easy if, I mean, if we kind of forget the rabbinic text for a while and just say the Quran, let's say, or the Book of Mormon. So is it, it what's the, is it, should I just tell people it's forbidden to read the Book of Mormon or it's forbidden to read the Quran? Or do I say, look, if you want to read it, you need to, if you're a believer in Yeshua, you need to carefully differentiate right. between the ideology and the religious claims that the text is making about the world, about God, right. about God's people, about what true piety looks like. You have to differentiate those, the propaganda of the document. Right. And you could say, okay, no, I'm going to look at the Book of Mormon, and and we we touch on this in our critical issues class at Torah Resource Institute. Is like, 
Well, what we do is we look at the historical development in the colonial times, you know, before the establishment of the, of, uh, the United States, and we look at the different uh, groups that were imagining the the different Indian groups, right, or Native American tribes, as speaking some sort of lost Hebrew of could these be the lost tribes? So in other words, this kind of rhetoric had been in the air for over a hundred years, maybe even two hundred years before Joseph Smith writes the Book of right. Mormon. And then we also know that that treasure hunting was a real big thing in the early eighteen hundreds, right? So uh, so. What we say is we we then can look at the Book of Mormon as a product of a specific religious time and place, you know, heavily influenced on the King James Bible. And with the case of Joseph Smith, we can see that he wasn't a good Hebrew student, right? Because he had a, we know he studied Hebrew and we have the comments of his teacher, right? So, so, so we go, okay, so I can, I can kind of see and actually appreciate not, not positively in terms of that it's revealed the word of God, because it's right. not, it's false right. prophecy, but I can properly put it in history. And I'll do the same thing for the Quran, you know, and we do the same thing for the Zohar, right? And so, you know, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Same thing with Josephus, same thing with Philo. Some some of these documents we we can learn a little bit more about, some, some we can't. And that's the role of a historian, uh, people who uh, want to understand history, that's that's totally cool endeavor. Thank you so much for watching this video. Tell us your thoughts on this subject by leaving a comment in the comment section. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and enable those notifications. And we'll see you in the next video.